Literally by a clip. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. This is the uh, Mayor's Budget Address. I'm Steve Kay, the Vice Mayor of the Council, and my job is to introduce the Mayor. Now, as everybody knows, when you have that job, the first thing you do is you go on to Google. And you... So I did that, and the only thing I could find out about the Mayor is that she served on Council for 12, 16 years, four on council, four as vice mayor, and there was nothing else there. I don't know what, I think somebody scrubbed it. Um, so, I, no, I don't have any, any uh, anecdotes to tell, but I, I just want to say that um, we really welcome the mayor today. The mayor has been on the other side of this podium for 16 years. She said in a meeting this morning, this was her 17th budget. So we know that we're in good hands, and I ask you to welcome Mayor Gordon to the podium. Thank you very much, Vice Mayor Kay. <laughs> it's great to see a full house, but then the budget address is always that way, right? Good afternoon. It's great to have the opportunity to talk to our council members and our citizens about the most important thing we do all year, our city budget. On July 1st, 2019, Lexington will start a new budget year. The good news is I don't think our citizens will notice many differences. The budget I'm proposing today is the result of extreme diligence to preserve what makes us great as we begin to face new challenges. It maintains and protects the programs our citizens value. 
The vital roles government plays in maintaining a strong city are in place and as strong as ever in this budget. Police and fire protection, E911 service, popular parks programs, waste collection service, road improvements and maintenance, support for neighborhoods, funds to help those who are most in need of our help and more. This is a continuation budget and in Lexington that means a continuation of excellent government services, a continuation of high quality of life, a continuation of outstanding public safety, and a continuation of strong financial management. This budget is balanced and fiscally responsible. It keeps our financial house in order, and it establishes the resiliency needed in the challenging years ahead. Put simply, it resets our spending. Why do we need to reset our spending? Well, let's take a few minutes and talk about that. And first, take a look at this chart. The red line at the top represents our projected fixed expenditures, like pension, salaries, and debt service through fiscal year 23. The blue line shows you our projected revenue through fiscal year 23. I want you to soak that in. The gap in the middle, well, that's our problem. Our expenses are rising faster than our revenue. That's why we must reset spending with this budget. Through no fault of our own, we are likely to face years of continuing increases in pension costs and slow revenue growth. And at the same time, demands for public safety and other governmental services continue in our growing city. In the budget I'm proposing today, public safety is 57% of our general fund budget. The meaning of this chart to me <clears throat> is that we have to find opportunities to change our expenses first. We're also very grateful to our previous leadership and to council for having the foresight to create the Budget Stabilization Fund. It and many other prudent decisions will allow us to face the future on much better ground than other cities. So what does reset spending mean in this budget proposal? <clears throat> While it means little will change about the city services citizens rely on, especially public safety and the dollars that help the people who need it most, it also means that cuts are part of every division budget, government-wide as well as most of the budgets of outside agencies and partner agencies that receive government money. And it means that we had to say no to a lot of worthy requests for funding for new or expanded services. Let's take a deeper dive into the numbers that are driving my budget. As cities across the state and the nation can attest, our nation's economic growth is slowing. In the current budget year, fiscal year 19, our city's revenue dropped almost $6.5 million from the budget adopted almost a year ago, requiring operating cost reductions and a slowdown in hiring. We made those adjustments just two weeks after I took office in January. Every independent external expert my team consulted has predicted this revenue slowdown will continue next year. 
because of this uncertainty, we were very careful in setting the fiscal year 20 revenue estimate. We consulted the Center for Business and Economic Research at the University of Kentucky's Gatton School, state projections, U.S. Department of Commerce GDP, U.S. Business Roundtable, the Federal Reserve, and the experience of other cities. As they recommended, I have built this budget on a projected growth rate that is the lowest in several years. As we started to put this budget together, we asked each city division, including the mayor's office, the council office, and public safety, to cut 15% in their unrestricted accounts. Partner agencies and our constitutional offices were asked to do the same. Even after that 15% cut, we still had over $11 million more in continuation funding requests than our budgeting team forecast in revenue. With this, these numbers this unbalanced, I had to establish some broad direction for my budget team. So we built this budget with the following common sense guidelines in mind. No tax increases in this budget. Our citizens expect us to do everything we can to tighten our own belts first before we ask them to pay more. And raising taxes alone will not be the solution to our problems. No layoffs. We need our highly professional staff to ensure that excellent service to our citizens continues. But to protect everyone's job, tough choices were required. There are no salary increases built into this budget for non-sworn personnel. This is one of the decisions we've made in the budget that I'm most concerned about. Our employees are excellent, and they deserve a raise. No new positions. A major component in finding savings is to have each office look at where they can become more efficient and prioritize the work they do. This is the time to modernize many of our functions. Continued slowdown in hiring for the next 15 months. There's a comment. <laughs> A 12-day furlough of my higher paid senior leadership staff. I have notified these staff members that beginning July 1st, they will be furloughed one day each month. Elected officials legally cannot be furloughed, so I will write a check back to the government for my portion, equaling a 12-day furlough. The bond package I put together will not have a meaningful debt increase. Our debt stands at over 12% of our general fund budget. Our bond rating agencies and our very own ordinance all say this is out of alignment with where it needs to be. As council members know, bond ratings have a direct impact on our borrowing costs. Good ratings send a signal to business that we have respected bond and budget management. Additional borrowing now will make the future cost of borrowing exponentially more expensive and only push some of our tough decisions onto future mayors and councils. To keep our debt percentage from growing, we are limiting bonding to $15.4 million in this budget proposal, the lowest since 2013. 
Even so, our budget service, our debt service for this bond will be at least $1 million annually for 12, 20 years, excuse me, starting in fiscal year 21. Let me say that again. Even so, our debt service for this bond will be at least $1 million annually for 20 years, starting in fiscal year 21. Very limited use of non-recurring funds on recurring expenses. Using non-recurring funds on recurring expenses results in a budget that has spent next year's growth dollars before it even gets them. It's just like a family that can't get out from under credit card debt. Your paycheck and even your raise is spent before you get it. For government, it's kicking the can down the road, making future years even tougher. It's like a red flag, signaling that we aren't serious about fixing our current structural issues. Protect the Rainy Day Fund. It is for unforeseen emergencies. If national experts are correct, then it is prudent that we reserve what we've saved for when it may really be needed. It is also one-time money. Use the Budget Stabilization Fund only for what it is intended. This money was set aside for pension payments. I have used a portion of it in this budget to cover part of the $3.3 million in increased CERS pension costs, and we will need the rest in years to come. Total fixed pension cost in this proposed budget is $60.7 million. Now, I want to highlight a few of the expenditures that are in this budget. Since public safety is 57% of the $379 million general fund budget I am proposing today, public safety is a good place to start. We will continue to fill vacancies in sworn personnel, police officers, firefighters, and corrections officers. In fire, we plan to purchase a ladder truck and a fire engine for $2.3 million. Spend $1 million on self-contained breathing apparatus. This investment will provide the match for a potential $2 million federal grant. Spend just over $500,000 on cardiac monitors and to replace turnout gear. Continued commitment to open our new Masterson Station, Fire Station, and fully staff it. Community paramedicine is a funding request that I could not fit into this budget. And that is especially concerning to me. It is an outstanding program. As a registered nurse, I totally understand how important it is, but it was grant funded. It costs $637,000 a year, and of that, $500,000 is a recurring personnel cost. I believe there are some community partnerships we can find to help us afford this and I will begin exploring that possibility. In police, we will spend $3.2 million to replace vehicles, and we will spend $120,000 on ballistic vests. In corrections, we will purchase an inmate transport vehicle for $165,000. In social services, we have kept funding in place that helps those in our city who need it most. Our extended social resource grants, known as ESR, 
The funds we use to assist social service agencies throughout the community will remain at the same level as this current year, $3 million. Since 2012, our city has almost doubled funding for these grants as federal and state governments have cut back. Especially this year, this is an unusual commitment at the local level to quality of life for our citizens. We are also giving $170,000 to the National Alliance on Mental Illness for Mental Health Court, $2 million to our Affordable Housing Fund, and $750,000 to help people who are homeless through our Office of Homelessness Prevention and Intervention. This budget expands our Office of Economic Development by adding the Planning Division to the Chief Development Officer, Kevin Adkins's responsibilities. My transition team called for improved coordination between planning and economic development. Also in economic development, Job creation and workforce development remain a priority with funding for our new industrial authority, which is designing a plan for our new economic development property at Coldstream. $200,000 for workforce development with a focus on local needs, the needs of employers and workers. Our Purchase of Development Rights Program, which protects our farm businesses, will be restored in my budget with an investment of $401,000 to enable that program to continue. In infrastructure, we have included $8 million for paving, $650,000 for traffic signals, $100,000 for pedestrian safety, and $100,000 for pedestrian safety improvements near the university. These funds are part of the agreement with the university, which gave UK title to portions of streets around campus in exchange for economic development land at Coldstream. I believe that tight budgets offer opportunities for every one of us, government divisions, partner agencies, business, and community groups. These are opportunities to find new sources of funding, both private and public, to uncover new efficiencies, engage the public, and encourage everyone to give back to our community. Increase transparency and accountability. Be more results-oriented and more. As a first step, I plan to bring together the best minds in town to help us analyze our revenues and expenditures. This will be a very small, independent group that can recommend steps to modernize our finances. As I said at the beginning, in putting together this budget, we worked really hard to protect great services we provide to our community and to sustain the positive momentum we've achieved over the last few years. We will remain in a strong position to face the coming challenges ahead by continuing to do the hard work needed now. Many opportunities are missed because they come dressed in overalls and look like work. This budget is a message to all of us. It is time to do that work. Thank you very much for being here.
Bum 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 b